what should move forward in time with me and what should be let go as if it's dead wood. And the more dead wood that you let go of and burn off when you have the opportunity, the less it accretes around you. Here, here's something interesting about forest fires, you know. People have been trying to prevent forest fires for a long time. The forest fire can burn so hot that it burns the topsoil right off. In which case you don't have a forest at all anymore, you just have a desert. And lo lots of trees are evolved to withstand forest fires of a certain intensity. And some won't even release their seeds unless there's been a fire. And so a little bit of fire at the right time can stop everything from burning to the ground. And that's also a really useful insight, a metaphorical insight into the nature of sacrifice, right? It, it's also a lot easier to let go of something when you're deciding to let go of it because you've decided yourself that it's, you're done with that. It's a weak part of you. It needs to disappear. You do that yourself, it's much better and much easier than it is if it's taken away from you forcibly, in which case you're very much likely to fight it. These other, there's another interesting thing here. A, a motif that runs through the entire Bible. It's a very, very powerful motif. And it's partly associated with this idea of walking with or walking before God. And, you know, in, in the New Testament, Christ says something like, thy father's will be done. And, and he means that that will should be done through him. And so, I, I can't, I won't be able to state this exactly right, but it's something like this. You know, a lot of what people regard as their own personalities and, and are proud of about their own personalities aren't their own personalities at all. They're useless idiosyncrasies that differ them, differentiate them trivially from other people. But they have no value in and of themselves. They're more like quirks. I remember once I was trying to teach a particularly stubborn student about how to write. And she had written a number of essays in, in university and, and got universally walloped for them and the reason for that was she couldn't write really at all she, she was really really bad at writing and so i was sitting down with her trying to explain to her what she was doing wrong and she was being very annoying about it very recalcitrant very very unwilling to listen that was a pearls before swine thing you know and at one point she said it, it, it i can write perfectly well this university professors just don't like my style and I could feel my hands creep towards her neck. <laughs> yeah, well, that'd, that'd be funny if it wasn't true, but it was also true. You know, and I thought, what the hell's with you? You can't even write, and you think you have a style. And not only do you think... <laughs> yeah, not, not knowing how to write is not a style. That's the other point, right? And so, you know, she, she, instead of humbling herself, which was necessary, and okay, right? Because she was a new university student. It's like, of course you don't know how to write. When were you going to learn? In school? I don't think so. <laughs> well, so she was proud of her insufficiency. That's arrogance, right? That's not humility. It's self-deception and arrogance. To be proud of your insufficiency, that's a very foolish thing. And that means to cling to the parts of you that are dead. Back to the walking with God idea. You know, as you elevate your aim, you create a judge at the same time, right? Because the new ideal, which is an ideal you, even if it's just an ideal position that you might occupy, even if it's still conceptualized in that concrete way, that becomes a judge because it's above you, right? And then you're, you're terrified of it, maybe. That's why you might be afraid when you go start a new job, right? Because you're, this thing is above you and you're terrified of it and it judges you. And that's useful because the, the judge that you're creating by formulating the ideal tells you what's useless about yourself and then you can dispense with it. And you want to keep doing that and then every time you make a judge that's more elevated, then there's more useless you that has to be dispensed with. And then if you create an ultimate judge, which is what the archetypal imagination of humankind has done, say, with the figure of Christ, because if Christ is nothing else, he is at least the archetypal perfect man and therefore the judge. You have a judge that says, get rid of everything about yourself that isn't perfect. And of course, that's also what Abraham, that's also what God tells Abraham, right? He says, to be perfect, to pick an ideal that's 
high enough and you can do this the thing that's interesting about this i think is you can do it more or less on your own terms you have to have some collaboration from other people but you don't have to pick an external ideal you can pick an ideal that fulfills the role of ideal for you you can say okay well if things could be set up for me the way i need them to be and if i could be who i needed to be what would that look like and you can figure that out for yourself and then instantly you have a judge and i also think that's part of the reason people don't do it right why don't why don't people look up and move ahead and the answer is well you know you start formulating an ideal you formulate a judge it's pretty easy to feel intimidated in the face of your own ideal that's what happens to cain versus abel for example then it's really easy to destroy the ideal instead of to try to pursue it because then you get rid of the judge but it's way better lower the damn judge if it's too much like if your current ambition is crushing you you know then maybe you're playing the tyrant to yourself and you should tap down your ambitions, not get rid of them by any stretch of the imagination, but at least put them more reasonably within your grasp. You don't have to leap from point one to point 50 in one leap, right? You can do it incrementally. But I really like this idea, I think it's a profound idea that the process of recapitulating yourself continually is also the process of, it's a phoenix-like process, right? You're shedding all those elements of you that are no longer worthy of the pursuits that you're that you're valuing. And then I would say, the idea here is that as you do that, you shape yourself ever more precisely into something that can withstand the tragedy of life and that can act as a, as a beacon to the world. That's the right way of thinking about it. Maybe first to your friends and then to your family. It's like it's a hell of a fine ambition and there's no reason that it can't happen. You know, every one of you knows people who are really bloody useful in a crisis and people that you admire, right? Those are all, you can think of all those people as you admire, that you admire as partial incarnations of the archetypal Messiah. That's exactly right. And the more that that manifests itself in any given person, then the more generally useful and admirable that person is in a multitude of situations. And we don't know the limit to that, but people can be unbelievably good for things, you know? It's really something to behold. In order to have any positive meaning in your life, you have to have identified a goal and you have to be working towards it. And there is a technical reason for that. And the technical reason, as far as I can tell, is that the circuitry that produces the kind of positive emotion that people really like is only activated when you notice that you're, when you're proceeding towards a goal that you value. And so that means that if you don't have a goal that you value, you can't have any positive emotions. So technically that's the incentive reward system and it's the underlying circuitry is dopaminergic. And when that circuitry is activated, then it's part of the exploratory circuit. It makes you, it gives you the sense of being actively engaged in something worthwhile. And that's, you know, you, you tend to think of positive emotion as something produced by reward, but there's two kinds of positive emotion. One is the reward that's associated with satiation and that's consumatory reward, and that's the reward you get when you're hungry and you eat. But the thing about eating when you're hungry is that it destroys the framework within which you were operating, right? It's time to eat. Well, you eat, and then that framework's no longer relevant, so the consumatory reward eliminates the value framework, and then you're stuck with, well, what are you gonna do next? And so the consumatory reward has with it its own problems, but the incentive reward is constantly what keeps you moving forward. And incentive reward, because it's dopaminergic, also is analgesic, literally analgesic. So if you're in pain, you take opiates and that, that will cut the pain, but so will psychomotor stimulants like cocaine or amphetamines. And so it's literally the case that if you're engaged in something that's engaging and you're working towards a goal, that you're going to feel less pain. And you can see this happening with athletes who, you know, they'll break their thumb or something, or maybe sometimes even their ankle, and they'll keep playing the game. Of course, afterwards, they're suffering like mad, but the fact that they're so filled with goal-directed enthusiasm means that, well, the pain systems are in some sense shut off. So that's an interesting thing because what it suggests, I mean, then you could imagine, I might say, well, how happy you are you that you've made a certain amount of progress? And if you think about it, what you'd say is, well, it depends on how much progress and in relationship to what. So, hypothetically, you're going to be happier if you've made quite a bit of progress towards a really important goal. 
And then you have to think through what it means for a goal to be really important, because that's not obvious. Now, you could say, you're in this class, and you're listening to some information, and maybe there's two reasons for that. You might find the information interesting per se, but let's forget about that for a minute. You need to listen to the information so that you can do well on the assignments, so that you can do well in the class. You need to do well in your classes so that you can finish up your degree. You need to finish up your degree so that you can find your place in the world. You need to do that so that you're financially stable and maybe you can start a family and have a life and that's all part of being a good person, something like that. And so, that's a hierarchy of goals and you might say that being a good person would be the thing however vaguely thought through, that's at the top of that hierarchy. And then, when you're doing things that serve the, that ultimate purpose, then you're going to find those more meaningful, and that meaning is actually produced as a consequence of the engagement of this exploratory circuit that's nested right down in your hypothalamus. It's really, really old. It's as old as thirst, and it's as old as hunger. It's really an old system.